After my first attempt for USB for the N64, I knew I wanted to do more with the project. This first iteration requires an Arduino and then a separate chip from the Arduino to the USB communication. So you needed more pieces than made sense and it was difficult to piece together and I wanted to do better than that. The first step is finding a chip that has a built-in USB host. That way I can use the microcontroller that talks to the N64, can also talk to USB without any extra hardware. And I decided to use a PIC microcontroller. There's a variant that has USB built in. It would seem to do the job. So I ordered a microcontroller and all the other parts I needed and I made this a little breadboard prototype. I used a breadboard because it's a lot easier to iterate on. So if I need to make changes, I can do it really easy. Just move some pins around. After I got this put together, I immediately ran into problems. Something as simple as setting up a timer on the chip that I need to use to measure the width of pulses, it just wasn't working. I tried to enable the timer and in theory it should have been running, but the value from the timer just kept reading back zero, 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 zero. I couldn't figure out what was going on. So I decided to move on to some other aspect of the project, current monitoring, but it was having the same problem. The module just wasn't working. Why? That makes no sense. I was spending hours trying to figure this out. I felt like I was going crazy. I decided to do one last deep dive through the documentation to see if I could figure out what's going on. And I found a section titled Peripheral Module Disable. Yeah, that was it. The modules were simply disabled. So, you know, yeah, maybe try turning it on. That's that's what I need to do. So once I turned those on, oh gosh. it worked. Okay. And I felt okay. like I got some of my sanity back. Okay. That's my reenactment. It was just a, just, just a play. I already did this. Yeah. Um, read the documentation. With that out of the way, I was able to verify that this would be capable of talking to the M64 and the other concerns I had. So I decided it was time to design a custom PCB. I'm no expert at making PCBs. This is the second time I've designed one. It ended up not being as difficult as I thought it was going to be. I have some recommendations for you if you wanna try the same. First, I recommend KiCad as the software for designing the PCB. It's open source and free, and it's got great features. It works great, highly recommend it. The first step you gotta do is you figure out which parts you want, and you can go to a website such as Snap... Snapita? Snapita. You can go to a website like Snapita. You can look up the part that you want a footprint for, and you can download that to add to the KeyCAD library. DigiKey also lets you download the footprints, and you can also buy the parts on DigiKey, which is what I did. Once you have the library for all the parts you want installed into KeyCAD, you can then take those footprints for the parts you want and drop them into your design, and then you create nets for all of the connections you want to create. A net indicates a connection or network of pads and other parts of your circuit. And so a single net needs to be all connected to itself and not to anything else. So for example, you can specify a net for power. In my case, I have one for 3.3 volts, one for five volts, you also have one for ground. But then you also have it for all of the signal wires that you have throughout the circuit. Every connection should have a net associated with it. And so you can go to every single one of those pins on these footprints and you can indicate which net it belongs to. Now you can do the routing, which lets you drag wires from one connector to another. And the cool thing about having nets on is it won't let you connect to the wrong thing. I would recommend in the connection step to not connect ground anything. Mark the nets, don't connect it yet. Because at the very end, you can actually go through and specify an entire area that you want to fill with one of the nets. In this case, I just did ground and it automatically connects to ground everything inside that area. You might have to draw a few extra wires to get it to connect to ground, but I recommend waiting until after you get that area set up. The reason why you wanna do this with ground is having a large ground plane around all your parts. One, helps reduce noise, but also serves as a really helpful heat sink as well. So parts that get really hot, you have a pad that connects to ground and it actually helps dissipate the heat through the circuit board. After you get that all set up and you think it's all done, you have all the connections done, you can actually have it verify that all of the connections are connected. And then once you think you have that all done, you can export the project to a Gerber file and then use this video sponsor, PCB Way, to actually turn it into a physical product. As a kid, I always loved looking at printed circuit boards and always thinking like, wow, these are so magical. And it seemed out of reach being able to make them. But with PCB Way, you can design and print your own circuit boards. Being able to do that feels like it's a superpower. I feel like I've unlocked so many new project ideas that I could do 
because I can now build custom PCBs for them. And the parts I get back, I feel very happy with. If you're interested in getting the PCB design and you have some projects that you wanna create, I highly recommend you check out PCB Way. But don't think that's all they can do. They also offer PCB assembly. They do 3D printing for both plastic and even metal. If you're working on a hobby project or a prototype of any kind, or even mass production of PCBs, be sure to check them out. PCB Way is having their 10th anniversary this year and is offering discounts to celebrate, so be sure to check them out. So a huge thanks to PCB Way for sponsoring this video. So I sent my design off to PCB Way, and now it's just time to wait for those to come back. And through the power of editing, the PCBs have arrived. So let's open this up and take a look to see what's inside. I'm really pleased with how these PCBs turned out. They also sent me this handy ruler which shows how big common sizes are for parts. If I had this before I designed my PCB, I've made, made some different choices. For example, there are some really tiny QFN parts on my design that I have to solder by hand. Maybe in the final design, I'll go that small where I can have PCB way just assemble the PCB for me. But early on in the prototyping phase, I would recommend against getting such small QFN parts. All right, so I soldered the essential connections for running the microcontroller and seeing if I can get it to talk to the N64. When I plug this in, it should show controller two. Let's see if it does it. That's not it. Not it at all. Okay, I guess it's time to debug it. Okay, so it's been a few days. I went ahead and soldered some LEDs to this so I can use that for testing and the LEDs wouldn't light. I was able to get them to light directly if I applied voltage, so I figured the pins on this chip weren't actually connected to the board, which isn't surprising because it's a QFN surface mount, which it's tiny. The pins, they're under on the underside, so it's really hard to get it to, to see right. And I am kind of a noob when it comes to soldering. So I have been tinkering with it. I tried reapplying the solder and I I think I got it this time. It's not exactly seated in the right position, but I checked all the pins up close and it seems like they're all touching the correct pad. So I was able to power it up and the LED started working. So when I plug this in, hopefully it actually detects it. There it is. Controller, well, controller one, because they start at index zero like, like you should. But there we go. That works, yep, there's my little LED indicator light, the yellow one, if I push the button, it turns off. And that's just there's like a sanity test. So that way I can just push the button to verify that my controller's still responding to input. The button will be used for other things later, but for now, it's my sanity test. So I finished putting all the parts on the PCB as I had it designed. And it all seemed to be working except the power regulator, which, is the tiniest part on this. Well, it's not It's not smaller than the capacitors, but it is an eight pad integrated circuit that is just, the pads were tiny. And I, I don't know if I put it on wrong or if my circuit was bad or design, something was off. So I just decided to remove it. And I have a separate 3.3 to five volt regulator here that I know I've gotten to work before, and I'm just gonna solder that externally for this kind of hacky prototype, and then I may redesign the PCB later to have a different, easier to solder power regulator. So, I'm gonna do that now. <clears throat> well, it's not pretty, but I got it all soldered together. So let's just test the connections and make sure there aren't any shorts and that the voltage regulator is working. And I think I'm ready to actually start coding up the USB part of this. I spent way too long trying to get this to work, the, the USB half. I started by just getting the control transfers to work, which a control transfer is just a way to configure the USB device that's plugged in. And 
that took some time. But the good news is the other transfers are easier than control transfers. So once I got that, it should have been smooth sailing after that. But I tried everything to get the data to actually read and nothing would work. I poured over the code, double checking everything. I checked the documentation multiple times, trying to figure out how to just send a command saying, give me the USB data for the mouse input or the keyboard input, and nothing was working. So I decided to hook up to the oscilloscope to see which data is being sent and received. And I hooked it up, and there was nothing wrong. <laughs> there was nothing wrong. The data was sending as it should and coming back. And then I just noticed that apparently my error checking was wrong. I was thinking there was an error, so I was not accepting the data back when there wasn't one. So rather than relying on error checking code, I just pre-populated the location in memory where I was going to store the USB data with an expected value. I send a request to retrieve data from USB. And then afterward, I check, did the value change? If it changed, I assume that it worked. And lo and behold, it did. <laughs> that solved the problem. So I can now read keyboard and mouse data. And maybe later I'll figure out why I was reporting errors when they didn't exist. But for now, it works. I'm okay with the hacky solution, so I'm moving on. So after I got the USB portion working, I set up default controller bindings. And since I already have the N64 half working, in theory, I should be able to plug this in and just use it as a controller now. Let's see what it does. I'm gonna plug it in, detects the controller. Okay. <laughs> it's mostly working. I have the buttons mapped incorrectly, so the A and B buttons. I think I got I just need to swap those bytes. Let's test the keyboard. Oh ho, 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 ho. that works. It was the first try too. I this was the first take. I haven't cool. Well I've tested the parts in isolation, but it's still pretty cool. Okay, well technically it's not working. I need to fix the button mapping. But other than that, it works. So, looking good. So the bit ordering problems were really quick and easy to resolve. So with that out of the way, let's play some games. To start, let's just try Mario Paint. It was designed to be played with the mouse and sure enough, you can use the mouse. I think I need to increase the mouse sensitivity. It just, things move too slow. That's kind of true with most games, so if I were to do future iterations, I definitely want to make that adjustable. Next, let's just try Mario 64. Why not? I know you, you really want a joystick to play this game, and yeah, playing with the mouse was just stupid. It hardly worked, but it was fun to try anyway. You know, this Koopa the Quick Star is usually pretty easy, but I completely failed. I just gave up part way through because I had to keep like moving my hand all the way across the table over and over again just to keep moving in the same direction. It was awful. So how about we switch to games that are designed with the mouse in mind? I tried StarCraft and Command and Conquer for the N64. Both worked great. You can play the game with the mouse. It seems like StarCraft didn't do a linear relationship between joystick input and cursor movement. It felt like that they adjusted it based on how far you were pushing. I'm sure it was to try to make it feel the best they could with the joystick. But on the mouse, it's kind of weird where I feel like I'm moving as fast as I can and it doesn't feel quite right, but still actually a great way to play. It felt very natural despite that little curve issue and honestly made me want to keep playing it more. Command and & Conquer and StarCraft, both awesome to play with the N64 mouse. Next up, let's try first person shooter like Goldeneye. After figuring out how to get the controls right, it played really well. I just felt like I was playing a first person shooter with mouse and keyboard which is honestly my preferred way to play first person shooters anyway. The aim mechanic where you hold R to aim and then you can aim from kind of like a fixed position doesn't work because that was assuming you have a joystick where you could hold it in a far direction whereas with the mouse, it just ugh, didn't work. But you know what? Aiming without needing to do that works so much better with the mouse anyway. So it's kind of not necessary. And I did want to try Portal 64. 
it makes it hurt even more. I really want to finish this project now that you can play with mouse and keyboard. It just feels so natural. Although I guess if you want to play Portal with mouse and keyboard, there's just the PC option. But despite that, it just, it felt so good. I could even use the settings to adjust the sensitivity to just make it feel right with the mouse. And it was awesome. It makes me really want to be able to pick that project back up again. But I'm not going to give you guys false hope. I just don't expect that to be it happening. You should let go. And I'm also talking to myself here. So, anyway, that's N64 USB. I am very pleased with how it turned out. And the fact that I'm able to have this work on my own custom PCB means that there is a chance that I will try to develop this into something I can sell. So if you're interested in owning an N64 USB, then be sure to subscribe because I will be giving updates on that as it progresses. And with that, I'd like to thank PCBWay one more time for sponsoring this video. I'm super pleased with the quality of the board that they made for this project. And until next time, take care.